In the Western world, classical Greece is often viewed as the pinnacle of civilization. Philosophy, epic literature, and resplendent temples, all achievements owed directly to the unique genius of the ancient Greeks. However, it must be remembered that Greek civilization was not born in a vacuum. These people groups on the edge of Europe were encompassed by a diverse assemblage of much older and more sophisticated cultures. In this video, we will explore the unique circumstances that gave rise to ancient Greek civilization, but we must refrain from reducing this fascinating example of cultural interplay to a mere appropriation of the achievements and legacies of Eastern cultures. In so doing, we will not seek to diminish the achievements of the ancient Greeks in any way, but to contextualize them and bring greater appreciation to this incredible period in antiquity. Let us begin with the historical background. Following the upheaval and devastation which prevailed across Greece in the eastern Mediterranean around the turn of the 12th century BC, the great kingdoms and palatial societies of the Bronze Age were either completely destroyed or severely weakened. The Mycenaean civilization based in the Peloponnese vanished, as did its neighbor Troy along with the great Anatolian kingdom of the Hittites. The only surviving urban civilizations were Egypt, the Middle Assyrian Empire, and the mercantile civilization of the Phoenicians, based in cities such as Byblos, Beirut, Tyre, and Sidon. These Thalassocratic traders would fill the power vacuum left in Syria, Palestine by the Hittites and Egyptians. These people were responsible for the invention of alphabetic writing, which gained its unique position after the Bronze Age collapse made most other writing systems disappear. From the 9th century onwards, Assyrian kings expanded into this region, destroying cities or forcing them to pay tribute. However, this did not hinder connections between Greece and the Near East. Phoenician settlers reached not only to Cyprus, but also to Crete, and even to the far west, where they would found the city of Carthage. At the same time, Greek traders appear in Syria, and also establish the first Greek colony off the western coast of Italy. Most of this movement around the Mediterranean, including the westward expansion of Assyria, was motivated by the search for copper and iron ores. In 696 BC, the Assyrian king Sennacherib put down an uprising in Tarsus. The Greeks fought the Assyrians at sea and were defeated. As battles were fought, connections between the two spheres were intensified, as streams of refugees mingled with the traders. In 677, Sidon, the hub of Phoenician trade, was leveled by the Assyrians. Shortly after this, King Samtek of Egypt was able to reclaim independence from Assyria, enrolling Greek mercenaries in his army to do so. At nearly the same time, King Gyges founded the Kingdom of the Lydians and established connections with Assyria, thus opening up the royal road which brought the Ionians into further contact with the east. Throughout this time period, oriental influences continued to make an impact on Greek culture. Ivory carving, jewelry making, metalworking, and pottery from the east is introduced to the Greeks and subsequently adopted. Eastern motifs such as the master of animals appear in these works, as do scenes of hunting exotic animals such as lions. Mythological creatures begin to feature in Greek art as well. Among these were sphinxes, griffins, and sirens. Although these beasts were in use in Greece during the Bronze Age, they are revived and adapted to new fashion. Other creatures, like the Triton, had entirely eastern origins. Cult imagery changes as well. The bronze statuettes of a god brandishing a weapon in his right hand and the image of the standing naked goddess both originate in Syria. The goddess was quickly clothed after its arrival in Greece, but with an overtly eastern style of dress. However, the Greeks did not merely copy the products and styles they were introduced to, but were trained by the eastern craftsmen who made them, which over time allowed them to develop their own styles. Along with this imagery and skilled craftsmanship came one of the most important achievements for the history of culture, the adoption and subsequent adaptation adaptation by the Greeks of the Phoenician script. What is remarkable about this cultural transfer is the Greeks' innovative but largely unintentional creation of vowel notation. Most Eastern scripts were entirely concerned with consonants. Aleph, the first letter in the Phoenician abjad, actually started with a consonant, the guttural stop, but the Greeks took this word to begin with an ah sound instead. They also maintained the Phoenician order of letters. For both of these reasons, the Greek alphabet was able to become much more widespread than most Near Eastern scripts, which were, in the case of Egyptian hieroglyphic, for example, mostly confined to bureaucratic scribal circles. It should be clear already that this was much more than a surface-level trade of iconography. Rather, the cultures of the West and the Near East were being intertwined together at a massive scale. The Babylonians, Akkadians, Assyrians, Egyptians, Hittites, and Phoenicians brought not only their crafts and skills, but also religious beliefs and practices. The newly designed cult statues began to be housed in large temples and supplicated with burnt offerings. Just as Eastern traders brought along their skills and crafts, the diviners and doctors, at this time closely intertwined, brought along their sacred craft. Augury practices such as the examination of the entrails or liver of slaughtered livestock spread to Greece and Italy. 
The services of these divine healers were very much revered and desired by communities everywhere. We see the dedication of figurines of Eastern style at the Sanctuary of Hera at Samus, which were traditionally used to approach a healing deity. On the island of Anaphi, Apollo gains the epithet Askelitas, which is derived from the Akkadian word Azugalatu, which is the name of a Babylonian healing goddess. Though this circumstance might seem to be more of a stretch, we know this sort of linguistic transfer to be the origin of Aphrodite, whose name comes from the Semitic word Ashtarith, a name for the love goddess Ishtar. It would appear that in this circumstance, an eastern seer successfully invoked the name of this goddess to fight off a plague, and the Greeks took this miracle as an act of the healing aspect of Apollo's power. The very act of mediumistic prophecy, practiced so famously by the Pythia at Apollo's oracle at Delphi, descends from Babylonian practices. Not only were the ways the Greeks interacted with their deities largely affected by Eastern religion, but also the way they interacted with the deceased and the living. The afterlife was, in both Mesopotamia and Greece, pictured as a realm of mud and darkness, and is described similarly in the Homeric texts and the Epic of Gilgamesh. The dead were thought to be able to torment the living with disease, and they needed to be placated with offerings and libations. Their destructive power could also be utilized against one's enemies. The practice of burying a so-called voodoo doll in a grave to invoke wrath against the target was well known throughout antiquity, and has its origins in Babylonia. Similarly, the practice of creating and melting wax effigies as a curse was practiced in Mesopotamia and Egypt. Where we start to see a major departure from the inherited Eastern tradition is in the treatment of monsters and demons. To the Mesopotamians, creatures like Lamashtu were existentially terrifying and needed to be guarded against. The Greeks adopted much of the same iconography when they depicted the Gorgon Medusa, but instead she was transformed into a vanquished foe at the hands of the demigod Heracles. Mythologically, the fear of demons had been eliminated. A more skeptical and self-assured worldview was forming. If we decide to look at the developments of Greek art and religion in this broader context, then it is apposite to treat the literature of the time period similarly. Though many parallels between the Homeric texts and Babylonian texts have been drawn, many of them may simply be disregarded as universal literary motifs. Some similarities, however, seem unlikely to be coincidences. For example, the very well-known division of the cosmos between the sky god Zeus, the sea god Poseidon, and the underworld god Hades seems to be directly derived from an Akkadian text known as the Atrahasis, which retells the Babylonian creation myth. In this cosmogony, the sky god is Anu, the sea god is Enki, and the earth god is Enlil. In both instances, the divisions are decided by casting lots. The similarities between the two stories are striking, but this section of the Iliad has long been differentiated from the rest of the text, and its inspirations from Eastern literature may well account for this. The central theme of the Atrahasis is strikingly modern. Humans multiply and cause the earth to suffer. The sky god hears the earth's cry and attempts to destroy mankind. However, man survives this attempt, and to limit humanity's spread creates a means of birth control. This theme can also be found in the Greek text called the Cypria, which tells of the events leading up to the Trojan War. In this story, Zeus takes pity on the earth as it is oppressed by great multitudes of humans. Zeus considers using lightnings or floods, but ultimately decides to have both Achilles and Helen born, leading to the events of the Trojan War. It must be noted that the name of this story, the Cypria, is derived from Cyprus itself, which was, of course, under the most heavy Eastern influences. All in all, any discussion concerning the influence of foreign cultures on the archaic Greeks must go beyond artificial comparisons. Comparing the similarities in religious practices, art, or literature may lead one to conclude that these are just coincidences. But we must remember that the predominance of Eastern cultures at this time period was more intense than the Aegean Koine of the Bronze Age. Also, by framing this situation as Oriental versus Hellenist, we create an unnecessary dichotomy. When looking back at the Archaic period, we must not anachronistically insert our awareness of the fact that Greek culture would eventually emerge as a dominant force in the Mediterranean. By understanding the history of the period, it is far easier to discern the evidence for cultural interaction. That interaction, it seems, occurred at a deeper level than just the exchange of crafts and involved deeper religious and literary ideas as well. Therefore, we must take heed to not view the developments of ancient Greek civilization in a vacuum of our own making.